This program is a presentation of UCTV for educational and non-commercial use only. Welcome to A Conversation with History. I'm Harry Chrysler of the Institute of International Studies. Our guest today is John Campbell, who is the Ralph Bunch Fellow at the Council on Foreign Relations. Uh, from 2004 to 2007, he was U.S. Ambassador to Nigeria. His new book is Nigeria, Dancing on the Brink. Ambassador Campbell, welcome to Berkeley. Thank you very much. It's good to be here. Where were you born and raised? Uh, I was born in Washington, D.C., and I was raised in the Virginia suburbs of Washington, about a mile or so from Chain Bridge. Uh -huh. and, and looking back, how did your parents shape your thinking about the world? Uh, my father uh, did his career at the National Archives in Washington. Uh, he was an historian whose advanced degrees came from Columbia. And hence, uh, in the domestic atmosphere, there was always this interest in causation, but not superficial causation, but rather much deeper causation. That's one thing. The second dimension was a devotion to public service. As my father used to like to say, why spend your life making somebody else rich? Uh, the point was that uh, you got a great deal more satisfaction by going into the public sector. And both of those, I think, influenced me very much. My mother is from down in Virginia, uh, from an intensely conservative, small c, conservative background. And from her, I got the notion that at a certain level, many things change, but they change very slowly. Mm -hmm. And was there a talk about current events, world affairs at the dinner table? That never stopped. Um, on the other hand, there was absolutely no interest in Africa at all, uh, and precious little in Asia. The focus was on Europe, and it was on the Soviet Union. And where were you educated? I did my BA and MA at the University of Virginia in Charlottesville. I did a PhD at the University of Wisconsin uh, in Madison. Uh, as part of that process, I had a brief stay at the University of Edinburgh. And when I was actually writing my dissertation, uh, the uh, Institute for Historical Research at the University of London provided um, a, a home, as it were. And what was your dissertation on? It was on French Protestant refugees uh, in um, England, specifically in the 1630s. And the way, and this is somewhat counterintuitive, um, because they revived the economy of Canterbury and Norwich, two historic uh, cathedral cities, um, both of those cities ended up uh, favoring Parliament during the Civil War, not the Crown, mm. even though they were cathedral cities. And, and from with your uh, di dissertation in hand, did you enter uh, university life and yes, become a professor? I did yeah. indeed. I taught British and French history for five years uh, at a small college down in Virginia, Mary Baldwin College, uh, founded in 1842, uh, with an enrollment of about 800 students. The kind of institution that I think is um, um, uh, 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 the glory of the United States, where we have everything from, um, uh, from Berkeley to small colleges down in, down in Virginia that meet a specific need. Mm -hmm. But what led you then to enter the diplomatic service? Well, having been born and raised in Washington, uh, it was an option that was always there. In other words, uh, when I was in uh, elementary or high school, 
Uh, there were the children of foreign service officers uh, that I interacted with. There were the children of foreign diplomats who uh, were stationed in Washington that I knew. So it was always there. Uh, to be um, perfectly candid about it, uh, we are talking early 70s in which academic mobility was extremely difficult. And um, I was tenured at this little college I was teaching at, but uh, the question was, was I prepared to stay there for 30 years or do something else? And so on something of a lark, um, I signed up to take the, uh, uh, the foreign service exam. Um, the night before the exam was given, I was at a rather liquid event in <laughs> Charlottesville. Uh, and uh, I remember when I went to bed thinking that, well, uh, if I wake up, I will go off and take it. And if I don't, I won't. Well, I did. And I did. Well, that, maybe that was preparation in a sense for diplomatic parties. So it was a. Uh, oh, it's very interesting. <laughs> diplomatic parties, people never drink anything. It's far, it's far too dangerous. <laughs> I see. So your postings were where before you ultimately wound up in Africa? Um, uh, in the Foreign Service, uh, I started off as a vice consul in Lyon, then became a staff aide to the ambassador in Paris, uh, then went back to the department for a number of assignments, uh, was then uh, assigned to Geneva. And in Geneva, the part of the, um, the mission that I worked in had as its focus the UN High Commissioner for Refugees. And um, my particular uh, uh, area of interest were Vietnamese boat people. Mm -hmm. uh, let's talk a little about being a diplomat, because in, in today's world, it seems to be uh, changing quite a bit. What, what do you see as the skill set that is essential to doing diplomacy in this changing world? Listening, speaking writing, but then as you become more senior, management. Because an effective diplomatic mission draws on the skills of all of the people who work in it. Uh, a really good embassy is not one that is dominated by a prima donna ambassador. A really good embassy draws on the riches that it has to do what an embassy is supposed to do. There's often confusion on that point. What an embassy is supposed to do is advance the interests of the United States, as defined by the administration in office, which in turn has been elected by the people of the United States. What do I mean by that? What I mean by that is that diplomats carry out the policy of their political masters. After all, I've never been elected to anything. Now, if in fact a diplomat's conscience is so outraged by what he is being asked to do, then he has the option to resign. Mm -hmm. And in, in the context of, of this, how helpful was your background in history? Was it at all, or was it something that you put aside? It was something that I drew on every day and still do. Mm -hmm. um, a background in history. The point of history is that everything proceeds from what came before and was and is shaped by it. Um, causation. Uh, yes. There is immediate causation. But if you really are seeking to understand another country, you've got to get way below that. Now, why bother to do that? 
you need to do that because your job is to advance U.S. interests. And to advance U.S. interests, you have to have some understanding of where your hosts are coming from. Uh, this period that you uh, were serving, uh, especially with the fall of the wall in 89, but yeah. then 9-11, was there still clarity about the overall mission? I, I understand that you just said that you, you're responding to your political masters in Washington, that is the people who've been given the mandate of the people. But to what extent did a, did a uh, overall concept for America's involvement in the world emerge during this period, irrespective of who was in office? I think what's very important there is you can't uh, you can't reduce it to bumper stickers. Uh, it very much depends on uh, the bilateral relationship you're talking about. For example, uh, when the wall came down, I was serving in Lagos. Uh, I was um, um, the political counselor in Lagos. What were our interests then? Uh, our interests in Nigeria were, one, uh, the restoration of democratic and civilian government as soon as possible. It was a military dictatorship at that stage. Why? Because democracies tend to be much more stable than military dictatorships. Why do we care about Nigerian stability? Because Nigeria has had then and has now the heft to be a partner with the United States on a host of different, uh, particularly, uh, particularly African issues. Um, all of that, everything I have just said, uh, applies now. Uh, Nigeria is at present a, uh, has a civilian government with democratic aspirations and it's very much in U.S. interest that Nigeria become a fully functioning democracy because a democratic Nigeria is going to bridge the gulf that exists in so many African states between the government and the governed and make Nigeria, therefore, a more important um, um, actor on the international stage. Uh, and that's very much, very much in our interest. Mm -hmm. uh, before we get into Nigeria and your book, uh, uh, let me ask you this question. To what extent do you see this communications revolution, uh, the social networking technology, Facebook, Twitter, uh, uh, Al Jazeera, and the whole phenomena of uh, satellite television. To what extent is that changing uh, the work of diplomacy, democratization, which is one of our goals that you we were just discovering, discussing? Um, it changes the environment and it changes the context. Um, both for good but also for ill. Uh, for example, uh, at least some historians think uh, the fact that all of East Germany was able to get West German television uh, had a real impact uh, on what happened there now, what, more than 20 years ago. Um, social media, Facebook and Twitter, uh, in um, uh, some parts of Africa, uh, they are tools that civil society can use to counter election rigging, for example, um, officially sponsored rumor mongering, all to the good. But Facebook and Twitter can also be used to exacerbate ethnic and religious conflicts. Um, uh, in, um, uh, in some respects, it, uh, the negative side of it is it can play something of the role uh, that radio played in the Rwanda genocide.
Mm -hmm. In in uh, what it, what is your view of the WikiLeaks phenomena and how it undermines the the work of diplomacy? Uh, unmitigated disaster. Um, effective diplomacy requires free and frank uh, conversation with an interlocutor. Free and frank conversation takes place only when there is an element of trust. Absent that element of trust, there will not be the candor that effective diplomacy requires. Um, I would ask you right now, if you were an opposition politician in a quasi-authoritarian country, would you open up with the American embassy about the shortcomings of your own government when uh, in the back of your mind is the notion that it could appear on the front page of the New York Times next week, but even four or five years from now? Mm. Then, then how, if you were a sitting ambassador, would you adapt to this phenomenon? Because Slowly, painfully, try to rebuild the trust that has been so badly damaged. But, but what, how would it affect the way you communicate with, uh, with Washington and the, the, the written notes, say, that you wouldn't take? Wouldn't much, wouldn't much, because in the aftermath of WikiLeaks, we've gone back. Uh, to um, compartmentalization of um, of sensitive uh, uh, of sensitive reporting, uh, which in and of itself is a bad thing. Uh, I mean, uh, in the aftermath of 9/11, in the aftermath of the underwear bomber, uh, one of the one of the uh, the criticisms that was made was that the various parts of the federal government weren't communicating well enough with each other. Well, that's. Um, uh, uh, that's the danger of going back to a highly compartmentalized approach. But right now, if I were sitting in my office and uh, talking to an opposition uh, uh, parliamentarian, I would report it straight. The trouble is, he probably wouldn't talk to me in the same way he would have three years ago. Mm -hmm. and, and that is because he sees his, his life threatened, really. Or embarrassment. I mean, there are lots of stages short of being life-threatening. And finally, why bother? Mm -hmm. I mean, why add to your own burdens? Mm -hmm. uh, let's talk about uh, Nigeria again, and I'll show your book, uh, Nigeria uh, Dancing on, on the Brink. Uh, what was the most uh, difficult aspect of your job in Nigeria. Uh, in, in the context of what we've talked about, namely your, your background as a historian and what it is a, a, an ambassador's job is. What was the most difficult aspect of it? The difficult, most difficult aspect didn't have anything to do with the Nigerians. The most difficult aspect was that, as ambassador, I was head of a very large institution, um, consulate in Lagos, an embassy in Abuja, that was chronically understaffed and underfunded. Um, when I first arrived in Abuja, uh, Virtually none of the positions were filled at grade, and many, many of them were vacant. So the most difficult aspect I had in Nigeria were the resource constraints that were imposed by Washington, mm -hmm. uh, not by the Nigerians. Uh, and, and what does this tell us, that uh, we lack the globe, the resources to be the global power that we were, or that that Washington is a, a ambivalent about adequately funding foreign policy and is focused too much on on military expenditures. Um, first of all, we certainly have the resources in the diplomatic field to do anything we like. So that's not the issue. I mean, this is a very large and very rich country, when all is said and done. The United States. The United yeah. States. Yeah. Uh, so it's what we choose to do. 
The, um, the underfunding of the State Department is a subset of the general underfunding of government in general and the public sector in general, which goes back at least as far uh, as the Reagan administration. It's, it's been underfunded now for a long time. Uh, the deeper roots of it are an uh, American lack of interest uh, in the outside world, something which I would argue we can no longer afford, uh, and a misunderstanding or a lack of understanding about what diplomats do. Um, diplomats, who are they? Well, they wear striped pants, they push cookies, and they introduce French words into a conversation that makes me very uncomfortable. There is the, <clears throat> the perception of the Foreign Service as some kind of an elite, uh, and that grinds against a, a profoundly democratic and not elitist society like the United States. Now, you can argue to your blue in the face uh, 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 that the Foreign Service isn't that way, and in fact, you can trot out uh, the statistics that show that it remarkably well m mirrors uh, the, uh, uh, the background of, uh, of Americans. Um, but international relations in general, Africa particularly, is far away from the concerns of too many of our fellow citizens. How much had changed uh, from the first posting to Nigeria to the second uh, in, in terms of the functioning of the embassy? I, w I would presume that security had become a greater concern. Much greater. Security yeah. became a much greater issue. Um, there was a greater awareness of the importance of public diplomacy. Uh, of the need to, uh, uh, to reach out more broadly uh, to Nigerians than had been the case in the late, uh, late 1980s. Um, there was also uh, a huge uh, aid uh, presence. Uh, in the late 1980s, uh, during a period of military rule, uh, the aid presence in Nigeria was very small. Uh, by the time I left Nigeria as ambassador, um, uh, USAID was dispersing some $400 million uh, in assistance to Nigeria. But that assistance wasn't going for development. That assistance was overwhelmingly going for PEPFAR, the President's Emergency Plan uh, uh, for HIV. In other words, very focused on a single disease uh, and only somewhat more broadly uh, on, on, uh, on health generally. Mm -hmm. And uh, looking at, at Nigeria when you returned, did anything surprise you? Did, did, was, there, was it just this public health issue, or were there other changes that, that uh, yes, were quite was. apparent? Yeah. Yes, there were. Um, the um, uh, people look poor. Um, I think they were poor. Uh, and uh, beyond that, the biggest thing that struck me was um, amongst the people that diplomats talk to, and we can talk later about who they might be, uh, when I was there in the late 80s, there was great optimism. The optimism was based on uh, a, a kind of syllogism. It was, Nigeria is malgoverned. It's malgoverned because it has a military government. Uh, once we restore civilian democracy, we will be able to address the problems uh, that Nigeria has. Well, when I went back some 15 years later, the country had been at that point a, uh, uh, a civilian uh, ostensible democracy for some five years. Uh, the actual addressing of the fundamental problems of the country seemed to be as far, f uh, far away as ever. Uh, and uh, people were discouraged. What, what is uh, the most important thing that uh, our audience should understand about Nigeria? Objectively? What, yes. Yeah, objectively, that there are 250 to 350 different ethnic groups, depending on how you define what an ethnic group is, each of which has its own language. 
and that uh, the country is about 50% Muslim and about 50% Christian. It's by far the largest country in the world in which neither Christianity nor Islam uh, is the minority religion. Um, you add to that the fact that uh, around 1900, uh, perhaps a quarter of the population of what is now Nigeria uh, was Muslim and two or three percent was Christian. So what you've had over the past hundred years has been this explosive growth uh, in the Christian population, a doubling of the Muslim population, but Muslim growth has been nowhere near as rapid as Christian growth. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it's, Nigeria is really a, a, a creation of its history, which was uh, the map uh, drawing of, of the British Empire. Absolutely, yes, absolutely. The, um, the territories that currently make up Nigeria had never been joined together in any previous historical epoch. Further, Nigeria as it stands now was put together by the British only in 1914, and they left in 1960. So not a very long period of time. And uh, it, uh, as ambassador, with this mission of, of realizing American interests, uh, when one reads your book, it, it's almost a uh, an account of uh, a, a very difficult situation where the the interface between our interests and what we're trying to achieve and the reality is 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 there's a huge chasm there, in, in the sense that. Uh, first of all, is Nigeria a failing state, or was it ever a uh, successful state? Um, Nigeria is not a failed state. Uh, I argue, particularly in the last chapter of the book, that it is a failing state, uh, but that failure is not inevitable. Um, has Nigeria ever been a successful state? Yes. Uh, in the immediate post-independence period, and then again at the end of the Civil War, uh, where the then military ruler of the country, General Gowan, instituted a um, policy of no winners, no losers. And in fact, the reconciliation of the Igbo and the old Biafra uh, 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 to Nigeria occurred at a certain level remarkably quickly. Mm -hmm. And and what followed then was uh, a deal uh, uh, about uh, uh, the reconciliation of the North and uh, the South in presidential elections uh, through a process that uh, took the name zoning. Explain that to us. Now that, of course, followed after a very difficult period where, uh, where Nigeria had a rather ruthless dictator. Um, really, there, there are two agreements. Um, the first is called federal character. And that has been around for a long time. Um, that comes out of the post-independence era. And what that means at base is uh, that the government guarantees equal access to government services to all parts of the country. Now, why did I hesitate on government services? Something like 94% of the profits from oil and gas go to the federal government. It is the federal government that distributes that money by formula to the federal government, the state governments, and the local governments. Beyond that, and related to it, uh, is the notion, for example, that each state in the federation has a member in the cabinet and also a minister of state in the cabinet. That's one reason why the cabinet is so big. <clears throat> Federal character is deeply entrenched in the Nigerian constitution. 
zoning, the notion that the presidency rotates between the North and the South and between Christians and Muslims is much more recent. It came about in the aftermath of the death of the last military dictator, Sani Abacha, in 1998. It is an informal agreement. It exists only within the governing party. However, the governing party wins all the presidential elections, just as, it's, uh, as it has done the one that, uh, that occurred last week. That arrangement was, uh, if you had a Southern Christian president, his vice president would be Muslim, and after eight years, the party would nominate a Northern Muslim to be president and a Southern Christian to be vice president. President Jonathan was the vice president to the Muslim Yumaro Urajua. Yumaro Urajua tragically died in 2010. That made Jonathan the president. The expectation in the North was that he would fill out Urajua's term but would not run for the presidency in 2011 because it was still the North's turn. Instead, he would wait until 2015. Uh, he decided to run for the presidency, uh, uh, and there was no legal bar to his doing so. Uh, and, um, well, uh, we have seen what the reaction uh, has been in the North uh, 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 to, his, um, to his victory. And, and that is violence, which we'll talk about in a minute. So, so what you're describing it, uh, are two formulas right. that uh, uh, allow for the division of the resources generated by oil. And we'll talk about uh, the Niger Delta in a minute and so on. But in, in the end, what you're telling us uh, very effectively in the book is that Nigeria, under these two formulas, has really remained a, a kleptocracy, basically, where office holders uh, at the various levels of government uh, essentially loot the enterprise. Is that an overstatement too harsh? It's a, it's a fairly recent development. Uh, it really came about in the aftermath of the Civil War. Uh, with the Civil War, you had a remarkable expansion of the role of the military. And in fact, the Civil War was followed by almost 30 years of military dictatorship. At the same time, oil came on stream in gigantic quantities, um, rather suddenly. And before Nigeria was able to develop the necessary institutions to manage that tremendous oil wealth. One of the consequences of essentially government ownership of the profits from oil and gas is the way you get rich in Nigeria is through state capture, uh, either through state office or through contra uh, uh, contra uh, contracts with the state or other things of that ilk as opposed to developmental enterprise. Uh, you, get, you can get rich very, very quickly if you have access to government, to government office. And further, in a society in which family, ethnic, and religious links are so important, you, in a sense, are obligated to participate in that contest because your own dependents are dependent on you for access to this wealth. So you get warring patronage networks at all level of government and uh, a lack of sense of, of uh, uh, a broad sense of what the public good might be. You, you point out that uh, since independence, uh, essentially 
Nigeria has de-industrialized. One, one figure that you cite is that in 2008, the amount of electricity is less than it was in, in 1960. Uh, and then another number is most of the population lives at the poverty level, but, but Nigeria has 115 uh, U.S. dollar billionaires. That's right. Now, whenever we're talking about, um, uh, about big figures like that, you never really know. That estimate of $115 billionaires uh, was given to me by some people in the banking industry in New York. On the other hand, they're in a position to know, um, but there's no list of dollar billionaires that you can go and find. Mm -hmm. Nevertheless, um, the, the reality is there. There are a tiny number of incredibly rich Nigerians, and at the other extreme, perhaps 46% of the population suffers from stunting, which means prolonged, uh, prolonged malnutrition. Mm -hmm. And in no way does there seem in, in your description of the country to be a base for a true democracy that would transform the system. No, I think there is. Uh, what is it, then? It's, um, it's civil society, civil organizations. Um, groups like the Nigeria Bar Association, um, but there are many of them, uh, particularly, particularly in the South. Um, and in fact, it is the civil organizations that played such an important role in the balloting that occurred a week ago on Saturday for the presidency which went better than in any previous election. The difficulty is the distinction between uh, casting ballots and counting ballots. And the, balance, the ballot counting process definitely had shortcomings. So the argument would be that the role of the U.S. in helping uh, Nigeria to move along a path of democratization uh, is uh, to work with civil society to, to further uh, uh, establishment of the institutions and, and, and routines that through elections might transform the That's system. Right. That is essentially the argument in the last chapter of my book. That's right. Uh, and the uh, despite all their shortcomings and their numerous, the fact that the elections of 2011 were better than those of 2007 uh, is, is, is a positive sign. Mm -hmm. Let's talk a little about the Delta, because it is the source of the money that greases the system. Uh, characterize the Delta force in terms of the enormity of, of uh, the reserves there of oil, and, and what is the, the political context in which it is embedded? Uh, first of all, what does a delta look like? Uh, it looks like um, the Mississippi Delta south of New Orleans, uh, or the Mekong River Delta uh, in, in Southeast Asia. It's huge. It's mostly marsh. Uh, it is highly fragmented in terms of ethnic groups. It historically is densely populated, and people have made their living uh, through, uh, particularly through fishing, uh, and through some uh, and through some farming. Um, the delta is fragmented. Um, there is. It's not like the House of Fulani in the north, who have a sultan. It's. It's. Um, uh, we need to think of the Delta as many, many uh, different, separate communities, and it's always been that way, um, um, back back as far as the 17th century. Um, the degradation of the environment in the Delta uh, is very, very striking. Um, uh, gas flaring. Uh, uh, oil leaks, 
Um, and the degradation of the environment is not entirely tied in with, uh, with oil theft. Some of it is because the industry is pretty old. It's more than 50 years old. And uh, uh, so some of the, uh, there has been, there's been a kind of undercapitalization um, of the industry. Um, an important hobby horse, it's very agreeable to blame what's going on uh, socially and economically in the Delta on the big oil companies. The difficulty with that is that oil exploitation is all done in, uh, by essentially joint venture with the Nigeria National Petroleum Corporation. Um, so one shouldn't think of the big oil companies as simply uh, muscling in and doing whatever they like. It's a partnership with uh, a, an entity of the Nigerian government. And as I've already said, uh, the vast bulk of the profits go to the Nigerian government. And, and oil is what uh, greases the system. Yeah. Uh, makes the patronage networks at all levels possible. Uh, and uh, importantly, the oil in Nigeria makes Nigeria the fourth or fifth uh, largest supplier of oil uh, uh, to the United States. So what, what you have is a coming together here uh, of interests uh, that are quite powerful. You do. You do indeed. The other thing, we didn't talk about natural gas, but the natural gas reserves are, are immense. Mm -hmm. uh, now, you, your, your book has a very insightful description of the politics within the Delta, and it, it seems to be one which is so I, I, the words that come to mind are decentralized, yes. anarchical, yes. and one in which shifting political uh, uh, alliances yes. mean that the guy who is a good guy today may be a bad guy absolutely. tomorrow. Absolutely. Uh, explain that dynamic. Yeah. No, absolutely. Uh, that that is absolutely right. You have a you have a part of the country in which a significant part of the population is disaffected. Uh, they're not in revolt. They are disaffected. But that means that they will often acquiesce to, um, uh, to attacks on the government or on oil installations because um, uh, they feel fundamentally aggrieved. Um, so at any given time, you, you have a kind of low-level violence going on. Um, those doing it um, today may see themselves as essentially freedom fighters. And tomorrow, they're essentially mafioso. They're basically out kidnapping uh, in order to enrich themselves. And then the following day, they may well be see themselves as political operatives, because what they're trying to do is advance the interests of their political patron. Um, so you, uh, it's, it's very, very kaleidoscopic. Uh, things are changing all the time. It's terribly hard to actually find somebody to talk to. In other words, um, who uh, should the Nigerian government consult with about addressing fundamental uh, Delta grievances? Or when Americans are kidnapped, who can the U.S. government talk to? Uh, it, it, this this highly decentralized aspect of it is a is a major complication. So so in the end, when when we have a a, a crisis in the Delta, uh, a, a kidnapping, a, a violence, an a attack on an oil installation, attack on an oil installation, uh, this this information spreads globally that this event has occurred, and and it could create shock waves in the system, but it does but, sometimes. And, and but but I have the sense, and and I should rem we should remind the audience that the name the subtitle of your book is Dancing on the Brink, that somehow the the system 
keeps going. Well, it does, and the um, the, the system has important regulatory um, um, aspects. Uh, in other words, the heads of the patronage clientage networks, uh, they certainly compete with each other, but they also cooperate with each other. And the current system, when it works properly, is in everybody's interest. And, and the, these, the big man, the ones who run the patronage network are called Og Ogbas. Well, that's the word that I use. They're called that in the southern part of the country, not in the north. Oba simply means chief, uh, and um, the it's in um, it's in common use in places like Lagos. Now the other uh, layer here is this Christian Muslim divide yes. uh, that is uh, exists uh, in the country, and the, the the North you characterize as a place where even the authorities often don't know what's going on uh, in, in terms of charismatic movements, uh, uh, sex, and so on. Talk a little about that, because on the one hand, it would seem to be uh, a seedbed of what we see as the threat from global terrorism, but the other hand, you seem to be implying, or I'm reading, that it's so such an anarchical system that it, it may just have national implications as opposed to global implications. Um, there are a couple of points to be made here. Um, first of all, it really is an enormous country, uh, and there are 155 million Nigerians. It's bigger than the Russian Federation. Um, so that um, the, uh, the government's knowledge of what's going on um, uh, everywhere is uh, of necessity uh, somewhat limited. The other point is that both amongst Christians and amongst Muslims, you have parallel religious revivals going on, so that the overall atmosphere is intensely religious. Islamic revival often takes the form, uh, or a form which is relatively decentralized. Some of the ideas come via the internet from um, the Persian Gulf or South Asia, but they are refracted through an African prism, um, Boko Haram uh, the, um, uh, being a classic example. This was a sect in the it's North. It's a sect, and yeah. it's still there. Yeah. Uh, uh, and basically, Boko Haram means books are evil. Western education is evil. Uh, but you see, that's religious revivalism. It's get back, we're going to get back to, to a pure form of Islam. Thus far, international groups have made remarkably little headway uh, in the North. Part of that is because Islam in the North is very old, dates back to the Middle Ages, uh, and uh, there is no notion that um, Wahhabist Islam associated with Saudi Arabia is in any way necessarily superior uh, to indigenous Islam. Um, now, you do have a situation in which if the North feels increasingly alienated from the government in Abuja, and that's one of the things that worries me about the, uh, about the election a week ago Saturday. And that is because the formula was broken. The formula because, was broken. Because of the reasons you that's just right. described. And in the North, at least, very, very few, or many, many in the North, uh, do not think that the ballot counting was straightforward and, and correct. Um, so the elections in the North do not have the same degree of popular legitimacy that they have in the South. Um, so what you do have is you're creating space for groups to either come in or evolve or develop. Uh, that could be um, contrary to the interests of Abuja, but also contrary to our own interests. Mm -hmm. if, if you're watching Nigeria uh, uh, today, you're no longer in the embassy, you're, you're, you're following events, you, you, 
you, you have this historical background uh, uh, and have, have become even more a student of Nigeria since you've left your posting. What, what are the, the red flags that, that really bother you? I mean, in your book, <laughs> there are a lot of, of red flags, and one, one can see uh, whether it's the, the Delta or the North or the, the unbelievable uh, deindustrialization of the country. Uh, a lot going on here that is troublesome. But give us a handle on specific red flags that would be of great concern to you. Um. Ethnic and religious divisions, which the Nigerian political system, um, particularly under zoning, uh, managed to contain pretty well. But that's broken down. If you take a map of Nigeria now, and you look at the states that Buhari carried. Buhari was the Muslim He's candidate, the Muslim candidate. Uh, running against. Good uh, luck, Jonathan, the good, Christian candidate. Right. The line goes straight across the middle of the country. Below the line is predominantly Christian. Above the line is predominantly Muslim. Country divided in half. This is something which previously was avoided. You combine that with increasing appeals to ethnic and religious identity. Uh, a fair amount of anecdotal evidence that a good deal of that went on uh, in the pre-electoral period. Beyond that, particularly in the Middle Belt, there is, uh, there, there is ongoing violence between um, House of Fulani Muslim herdsmen and uh, Christian Barom peasant farmers, uh, exacerbated in all probability by desertification and the pushing of the Sahara south, which means that herdsmen have to push further south. Um, so it's, it's religious division. Uh, uh, appeals to ethnic identities in a political culture which operates on the basis that winning is a matter of life and death and winner takes all, which means you don't have the sort of restraints uh, uh, on behavior that existed in Nigeria, say, say 25 years ago. It, what, what do you see as uh, the possible impact of the, the, the communications revolution on this vortex, I believe in the book you suggested that uh, there, there, there's something going on with regard to youth in the North becoming even more radicalized in, in their face. It's, it's a very interesting question. It's one I've been doing a lot of thinking about over the past few days. Um, the question, sort of widely discussed amongst the chattering classes, particularly in Lagos, is, could something like Tunisia or Egypt happen here? Uh, after all, in many respects, the country is worse governed than either, uh, either Tunisia or Egypt. Let's take that idea and let's put it over here. In the violence that was going on last week in the North, those who were particularly attacked were supporters of the ruling party. That included three important traditional rulers, the Sultan of Sokoto, the par paramount Muslim uh, traditional ruler, the Emir of Kano, the Emir of Zaria, and in fact their private residences were burned down. Mm. Now, they are northern traditional rulers, but associated with the ruling party and in at least some of the popular mind associated with these elections that were not legitimate. So, is the violence in the North that we're seeing now essentially atavistic or is it something new? I think it is very, very facile to presume that somebody like Muhammadu Buhari could control it by essentially telling his supporters to back off. I don't think he has that kind of control. What do you see as the future American role 
in responding to uh, possible trouble in this vortex. There's not we, much. Not much that no, we did. Not much. And, and you, no. you would issue on a warning that uh, at no time would we want boots on the ground oh, Lord, no. in in this, even if it were a force uh, that were whose purpose was to intervene in other parts of Africa. Oh no, uh, absolutely not. Um, uh, I mean, uh, I think the last thing the American people want uh, is. Um, uh, another case of military involvement, and I can imagine no greater disaster uh, uh, to our interests in Nigeria uh, than some kind of American military presence there. No greater disaster. Mm -hmm. Talk about radicalizing people in the North. I would do it. Mm -hmm. uh, looking at the future, how, how would you advise students to prepare for a future in which they might have in mind diplomacy, uh, Focusing on uh, on Africa, uh, be passionate about something, uh, and that something could be anything from French uh, to history to philosophy. Uh, but be passionate about something. Um, the uh, it's terribly important uh, for diplomats uh, to be broadly based. Um, uh, sure, uh, international relations, political science are obvious areas, but I have known um, uh, I've known highly successful diplomats uh, who, uh, who who were passionate about 17th century French literature. On that note, uh, Ambassador, uh, let me show our audience your book again because it, it really is a, a great way to get into an understanding of what's going on in Nigeria. And I want to uh, thank you very much uh, for thank taking you time much. to being on our program. It was a it was a very informative discussion. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you very much for joining us for this conversation with history. Mm -hmm.